By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim? Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And today I have something special for you because I have a game of Fallen Empires only. Because I am right in the middle of a Fallen Empires constructed tournament. There was even a uh, live uh, live stream on the channel last week. Maybe maybe you had a chance to see that one. Uh, and the idea of this tournament is simple. You have to construct a 60 card deck and all the cards have to be Fallen Empires except for the basic lands. Of course, you can only play four of each. And in today's episode, I'm going to show you uh, the first game that I played in this tournament. Uh, I am playing with a deck that I've called the Unlikely Alliance. It is a deck that is three colors. It's blue, it's uh, black, and it's green. And I am playing against Frank, and Frank is playing with a white and red deck that I've called the Flying Circus. Now, before I go to the games themselves, I will first do a deck tech. Now, if you wanna go straight to the games, no problem. Check the description below, click on the timestamps, and it'll take you straight to the action. But maybe, you know, it could be interesting to sit back and listen to the deck text because I have pictures of both of these beautiful, unique Fallen Empires decks. And I'm going to start with Frank's Brew, The Flying Circus. And here we see the deck of my opponent, Frank. And as you can see, it's completely uh, Fallen Empires. You see there the sideboard, there are some notes saying Conchhorn. I can tell you that they've been replaced by the real thing. So uh, Frank got his Conchhorns in the middle. So that's good news for this matchup. And as you can see, um, he's playing with four hand, Hands of Justice. Now, Hands of Justice is extremely strong in Fallen Empires because there is hardly any removal and Hand of Justice has six toughness. So you have to imagine Io Pilot, see a full playset there in Frank's deck. Uh, it's an artifact for two and you can pay one and tap it, sacrifice it to deal two damage to any target. It is an artifact you see in every deck. Why? Because there's no removal, there's no swords to plow here, there's no terror. There's, you know, there's nothing that can just destroy a creature. You only can use damage to accomplish that goal. So, I mean, you can play a Dwarven Catapult, but remember, Hand of Justice has six toughness. So, I mean, that's huge. It's really difficult to get rid of. Um, you've got uh, Ecation Javelinier as well, which is also great uh, removal. But uh, again, it only uh, deals one damage. I mean, it's great because there are so many creatures in Fallen Empire that only have one toughness they're actually are going to probably see a lot of play here, but it's not gonna help you against the Hand of Justice. So I think that, you know, one of Frank's strongest, uh, strongest strategies in this deck is to kind of stay alive until he can cast his Hand of Justice. He's playing with four of them. So that means there's a, very, there's a, a big likelihood of him finding one. In, uh, in, in interesting here is that he's playing Ecation Town in the sideboard and not in the main board. On the other hand, he has so many cheap casting costs of white creatures that, you know, he'll be fine. Now, the reason I've called this Flying Circus is because of the three Goblin Kites that he has in his deck. Um, and what he can do, it's one red and one, you can cast it, it's an enchantment. Now, there is no enchantment removal in Fallen Empires. So, <laughs> I know it sounds crazy, right? But this is a very limited format. So that means you don't have to worry about anybody taking care of your Goblin Kites. Once your Goblin Kites is on the board, it's gonna stay on the board. Now, Goblin Kites does something very special. You pay one red and it gives a creature with toughness uh, of two or less flying. So you can give all your one ones, your two twos, your one twos, whatever, you can give them flying. Now, flying in Fallen Empires is another word for unblockable. There are hardly any creatures that can actually get flying in Fallen Empires. So that means that Goblin Kites can make a creature unblockable for one red. Now the thing is, at the end of turn, um, you have to flip a coin. In this, uh, in this case, we will probably be rolling a dice. And if it ends up in your favor, the creature lives. If it doesn't end up in your favor, the creature dies. So a really nice combination in this deck here is Goblin Kites and Zealots. Now Zealots is a creature right next to the Hand of Justice. It is two white and one for a 2-2 two -two creature. When the creature is unblocked, so it doesn't have to deal damage, it's an important thing here, when it's unblocked, instead of dealing damage to the opponent, even if that damage is zero, you can also choose to have it deal three damage to target creature instead. So that means what you can do, or what Frank can do, I should say, 
he can use his goblin kites, give flying to his zealot, fly over to the opponent because there's hardly any flying. There's basically no flying in Fallen Empires. The zealot is unblockable. It can deal damage or actually be unblocked and then it can deal three damage to any target. So it is a very clever way of removing creatures. So I'm really curious to see if Frank can pull it off in this game. Another really interesting card is the card right next to uh, the Goblin Kites. And I'm not talking about the Dwarven Catapult. I mean, that's that's huge in Fallen Empires as well. But I'm talking about the Shield right next to it. The Shield is an artifact card that you can tap and you can give your uh, creature plus O plus 2. Now, why is this so important? As you see, Frank is playing with a lot of creatures with a low toughness. Toughness 1, toughness 2. And that means that when your opponent can play a Dwarven Catapult or has an IO Pile, he can basically remove a lot of your creatures. Now, a great thing that you can do to protect your creatures in Fallen Empire is actually using a shield. Your opponent is using, for example, an IO Pile on your Zealot. In response, you can activate your shield, giving your Zealot enough uh, toughness so it can survive the 2 damage because it actually gets plus 0 plus 2, so it becomes a 2-4. Now, um, before we move on to mind deck, deck, there's one little uh, creature card I want to uh, take out. Actually, it's not a little creature. It's a big creature. It's Orc. It's a 6-6 six, six powerhouse. Now, Orc, I find, is a very interesting inclusion um, because a lot of um, uh, decks in Fallen Empires, because the creatures have such a low power level, uh, uh, will actually only play with creatures with power 1, power 2. Maybe they'll have one or two creatures that have a greater power than that, but most decks will not have that. And that means that the Orc can actually be really decisive here. Another great thing about the Orc is that you can just put another body on the table and the Dwarven Catapult is just not as effective because it's got 6 toughness. So again, it's super, super hard to kill. The best thing to do against Orc is simply play a creature with power greater than 2 or pump your creatures up so that they have power greater than 2 so that Frank cannot attack. So um, all in all, a very interesting deck and uh, I'm really curious to see if these little plans that Frank has uh, is going to work out against me. And this is the deck that I am playing with today. I've called this deck an Unlikely Alliance and I've called it that because you see Homerids working together with a Voldalian Soldier and a Derelor. So especially the Merfolks and the Homerids are actually each other's opponents. They're fighting for the Voldalian Empire and Underwater Empire and Fallen Empire as well. Um, I've actually um, wrote a whole story that goes attached to this deck. Now I'm not going to re read the whole story to you because you probably just want to see uh, Magic the Gathering, but just a really quick summary of the story is that uh, a Hamrit warrior searches for the Darylor and the Darylor is really upset because a Thelonite monk just changed his swamp, his home into a forest and the Hamrit warrior is really upset because he sees that humans, the Acacians, uh, are expanding their empire and are now also trying to take over the oceans and are just seeing the ocean as one big uh, resource where they can just take stuff out of and they don't really care about the environment. So uh, in my story, the Darylor and the Humrit warrior go together and they go in search for a Fuldalian mage that's actually known as the artificer of the Fallen Empire because um, he can wield the war machine. So you see there are three war machines here, Fuldalian uh, war machines in this deck as well. So that's kind of the whole story. And that's also where the Dwarven Catapults come in and the Goblin War Drums come in. But like I said, I'm not going to uh, uh, bore you with the whole story. Uh, but there is uh, there is an idea flavor-wise behind this deck as well. I just wanted to mention that. As you can see, this deck is blue, red, and black. Um, and there, there there's... I really, I really thought about this deck. Basically, what I want to do, I'm, I'm playing with three spawning bats. So in my ideal situation, spawning bat is an enchantment for two blue. And for two blue and one, you can sack a blue creature and you get uh, Tamarit tokens. Those are uh, the, the, the children of Hamarit, you could say. Um, and you can make Tamarit tokens. So you have to sack a blue creature and you get X Tamarit tokens. Um, uh, according to the casting cost. So a deep spawn is eight to cast. You can see three deep spawn in this deck. And if I use my spawning bat on my deep spawn, I'm getting eight one one Tamarit tokens. And I also have four Hummerit warriors. Now Hummerit warrior is five, one blue and four for a three three. Horrible statistics, but in Fallen Empire, not so bad. Again, I can use my spawning bat. It will give me five one one creatures. 
and the Fodalian War Machine is an O4 blocker, two blue and one. O4, having four toughness in Fallen Emperor is actually pretty good. And again, in later in the game, I can sack it to my spawning bat. So basically what I want to do is I just want to sack a lot of my blue creatures to my spawning bat and create a lot of 1-1 one -one tokens. Now, a 1-1 one -one token by itself, that's already pretty good. But if I can add a Goblin Wardrums on the field, I can give my Goblin, uh, again, can give my tokens menace so that means that my opponent will need two creatures to block them now you can imagine if i sack a deep spawn to my spawning bat if i sack a hundred warrior to my spawning bat i already have 13 one ones and then if they all have menace it's going to be really difficult for my opponent to block all of them now still they just have one power now this is where the tidal influence comes into play now tidal influence is an enchantment for one blue and two and it comes into play with a tight counter. If it's if it has one tight counter on there, it gives all your blue creatures minus two, minus zero. So that's not great. If it has two tight counters on there, nothing happens. When it has three tight counters on it, it gives all the creatures plus two, plus O. Oh. So that means that I can start swinging in with all my Tamarit tokens with a power of three and menace with the Goblin War Drums. I mean, that is the dream. That is the dream that I want to live with this deck. I do realize this is a four card, five card combo. I mean, you know, it's not ideal, but if I can make it work, man, I'm on top of the world. Now, um, to give this deck some more chance, because this is just one plan, I've also decided to play four Darylors. Now, Darylor is really easy to splash because it's only one black. For one black and three, you get a four, four. That is huge in Fallen Empires. So hopefully I can draw them and kind of keep my opponent at bay. I want to stall the game as long as possible until I can get this weird spawning bad, tidal influence, goblin war drums, deep spawn, hundred warrior combo going. Now, I'm also playing with four Dwarven Catapults. Now, Dwarven Catapults, we saw uh, those cards in Frank Dex's uh, deck as well. They are just amazing. It's an instant. It's one red and X. And what happens is you can deal X damage. But here it comes. You cannot target your opponent. You cannot target a player. You cannot, you're, can only target creatures. So you're going to target the creatures of your opponent. And what it does, it divides the damage evenly over all the creatures of your opponent. So if I play a Dwarven Catapult for, let's say, four, so one red and four, I deal four damage to all the creatures of my opponent. And if my opponent has two cre uh, creatures, it means two damage to each. It is, if you have an uneven number, so if you can't divide it equally, it is rounded down. So if I uh, play a Dwarven Catapult again for four damage, but my opponent has five creatures, then all the creatures get zero damage. So it is not ideal. But it's really good because it's also an instant. So I can play it in the end step of my opponent. I can play it during combat. I can, there are a lot of tricks. I'm really looking forward to kind of play with this Dwarven Catapult and experiment around that instant uh, possibility. Now I'm also playing with four IO piles. You also saw them in Frank's deck. It, 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 it is an auto include. I mean, when, you're, when you want to pull off a really silly combo, which is extremely cool when it works, you have to put in some business cards. And for me in Fallen Empires, Iopile is definitely a business card. Dwarven Catapult, you can even see it as a business card. I'm also playing with four Conch Horns. Now what Conch Horn does, um, you can cast it for two, you can pay one and sack it, and you can look at, uh, and you can draw two cards from your library, and you need to put one card back from uh, your hand. It's basically a mini brainstorm. Now I've put it in here because it is a way to do some form of card selection and when you're playing a deck like this, you just want to make sure you do hit your land drops. You want to make sure um, that you can uh, can find the pieces that you need to assemble your combo. And talking about want to hit your lands, this deck has, I mean, wait for it, 26 lands. There are a lot of lands in here. The reason for this is I'm playing with a lot of high casting cost spells. And um, I, I also want to play out a huge Dwarven Catapult because that's a way, again, to buy time. So as you can see at the top, I'm playing with Dwarf, Dwarven Hold and um, I'm playing with Silos. These are two storage lands. That means they come into play tapped. Every upkeep, you can put a storage counter on them and you can start saving mana. And then you can untap them if you want to and you can tap them and take off X mana equal to your amount of storage counters. Now remember, you do have to take your storage counters off again once you've used them. So then you have to save up all over again. But let's say you have a sand silo for eight storage counters. You can tap it and you can say, you know what, I'm going to use five and then it, it takes back to three, right? So it's not like you lose all your storage counters, only the ones you need. 
Um, okay, well, I've been like rambling on about, uh, <laughs> about my tech for a long time now. So I suggest we're going to go to the actual games and we're going to see what's going to happen. Let's go to game number one. Game number one. Here we go. Fallen Empires only 260 card decks. The only cards in this matchup that are not Fallen Empires are the basic lands. And I am playing against Frank here who is sitting on the right side with his Demonic Tutor playmat. And I've got a Protocol Sorcerer playmat. I have to say that's not very flavorful because both of these are not part of the Fallen Empires expansion. So, you know, maybe I should get a Fallen Empires playmat for these games. Um, let me know in the comments below what Fallen Empires art you would choose, by the way, for a playmat. That would be interesting. I think for me, Deep Spawn then with this deck. I think you should have some Deep Spawn playmats. Look at that, by the way. Frank is taking a mulligan. So uh, that means um, he's going down to six cards and he's playing an Ecation Javelineers passing turn. I've started with a Dwarven Hold, a safe land. And I'm using a D20 for that. That is kind of difficult to see now that I'm, I'm looking at the recording. So I just have one storage counter now. And uh, passing turn here. There he goes, untapping. Playing a mountain. Ice Age lands that he plays with. Playing an Io pile. So that's that artifact we talked about. I think we're going to see a lot of that artifact. Two to cast, one insect, two, two damage. And I'm playing a conch horn, so another one of those useful artifacts. The conch horn, I can pay one in sack to draw two cards, and then I have to put one card back from my hands. So it's that mini brain geyser. Um, and I'm dropping to 18. And he's putting, well, not more pressure on. He's playing a goblin kites, and I believe he's missing a land drop. So that's good news for me. Remember, my dwarven hold keeps on ticking. It's on three counters now. I'm playing another conch horn. So probably going to activate a Conch Horn end step here. And let's see what Frank is going to do. Can he find some lands? I mean, when he has two white, he's probably going to cast a creature like Order of Lightbird. That would be a little bit problematic because it can deal two damage. Maybe a Zealot. Attacking here for one, so I'm dropping to 17. So, And he's just passing turn, so he's stuck on land here. So that's not great for Frank. And I'm drawing two cards with my Conch Horn, having to put one back. And my Dwarven Hold count goes to four. Playing a Swamp, can I do something? Deciding to tap, there's a Daralore, one of the strongest creatures in Fallen Empire. Four mana for a 4-4. Four, four. I mean, for a normal format, that's kind of strong in old school, but um, especially in Fallen Empires, a 4-4 is huge. And this is impossible for Frank to kind of kill at the moment, but if I attack with the Daralore, he can actually block with the Javelineers, deal one damage with the Spear Counter, and then use his Iopile to deal a total of four damage to my Daralore. Now, I don't want to do that, so that's why I'm actually using... My Io pile now on uh, Frank here so that he's kind of forced to use his Javelinier counter. And second main phase playing the Homerid Spawning Bat. Now remember, I cannot use the Homerid Spawning Bat on the Daralor, unfortunately, because I can only sack blue creatures to it. So that is a little bit unfortunate. Daralor is the only not blue creature in the deck. And uh, in the meanwhile, we do see that Frank has found some lands. We're both on 16 now. I think he needs a second planes to play Zealots in order of the Ebon Hands. Um, but he's not finding it. Just playing another Goblin Kite. So he's kind of stuck here. And that means I can just swing in for 4. Going to drop to 12. And sacking the Conch Horn here. And Conchorn is really great for the card selection. It makes sure that I get my land drops and keep drawing into useful stuff. Well, I mean, yeah, I guess you could say Goblin War Drums is useful. It's going to put some extra pressure on. So even if Frank's able to play out one creature, he cannot block it because Daralore now is Menace. And I believe, I believe I'm now talking about the, the combo that I want to assemble. Remember, I want to have a Goblin War Drums, a Hummerit Spawning Bad, a Deep Spawn, or a Hummerit Warrior, or both and a title influence on the board, and then I have my four card combo complete. 
And there is an Ikejin Infantry. It's a 1-1 one, one for 1 white and you can give it Banding and First Strike. But he can't even block it now because of the Goblin War Drums. Oh, and look at that. Another Darylor. Frank needs something now. He needs to get rid of these Darylors. This is not going to help him. A Storage Land. The white one. And um, I think it's pretty much game because he's on 8. He cannot block. So I can deal 8 damage here. That means that game 1 is going to the unlikely alliance and uh, we haven't really seen any flying circus shenanigans in that game one so hopefully uh, for frank we get to see that in game two we are now going to the sideboards and we'll catch back up to you in game number two game number two so i've got my first victory couldn't really show uh you the way my deck wants to work no spawning bat no deep spawn but of course, Daryl Lores are very powerful. And I, I have to admit, Frank, you were pretty much stuck on mana. Uh, we did some sideboarding, um, starting here with the Sand Silos. And again, we see that uh, Goblin Kites from Frank, which of course is a powerful card. But you do need some creatures to actually give flying. At least he's finding a second white here. And look at that. He's playing a Zealot. This is the 2-2 creature that I talked about in deck tech. When the Ziggler gets unchecked, it can actually, instead of dealing damage to your opponent, you can choose to have it deal three damage to target creature instead. Now, at this moment, I don't really have any targets. So uh, he's just going to deal two damage, which actually is pretty good by itself. Um, that means I'm dropping to 18 here and also an Ikation Infantry and an Io Pile. So we see way more pressure this time from Frank uh, early game. And there's another Io Pile. And I have to pass turn here. Remember, Frank had to take a mulligan as well that first game. And then having having problems uh, with, your, um, uh, with your mana. So he was just very unfortunate. I think now you see how his deck wants to work playing the Ikejian Lieutenant. So he just wants to put a lot of pressure on. He's kind of forcing my hand here. Uh, deciding to use one of the IO piles on the Zealot. Because, you know, I just want to stay alive long enough so that I can cast big blue creatures. And now he's pumping up his Ikejian Infantry with his Lieutenant. So I'm getting an extra damage. Dropping down to 16 here. Untapping my Sand Silos. Interesting. Am I going to do something here? It only has one counter on there so far, I think. Or no, three counters, actually. It's hard to see with the dice. And I'm taking one off. Ah, oh, of course, I need it for double blue. I don't have double blue. And that's difficult because the Spawning Bat, I can only cast with double blue. Destroying the lieutenant. I'm doing that now so he can no longer pump his Ikejian infantry in response because all his lands are tapped. So if I would have waited for his turn, he would go to the untap step and then he would he would attack. And if I then would activate my IO pile in response, he could still use his lieutenant to pump his infantry. Remember, I just want to stay in the game long enough so that I can get my threats out. I wanted I want to drag this into late game. That's what I want to do here which is actually proven to be pretty difficult. Already on 15, lost a quarter of my life total. Ooh, and I'm going to play something big. There it is, a Hummerit Warrior and a new Sand Silo. So now we've got that combo online where I can hopefully use my Spawning Bad on the Hummerit Warrior. I'm not even sure if that's the right play to make right now. I Dwarven Catapult. Dwarven Catapult in this case, great play, Frank, because Hummerit Warrior can actually give itself Hexproof for one blue. But I can't do that now because I don't have any blue mana left. And I think that's kind of the story of, of this game is I need more blue land. And it may sound odd with all the lands on the board in the sand silos, but it is difficult. So I'm using my conch horn, digging for answers here. I mean, a dwarven catapult would be really good as well. I could destroy both of the creatures. So, I mean, I'm not dead yet. Oh, look at that. A Fuldalian war machine. Beautiful art by Amy Weber, by the way, this card. So if you have time to check out the art, I would definitely do that. It's an 0-4 wall for two blue and one. And you can actually tap a Merfolk and then you can choose to um, give it plus two plus one or you can let it attack and you can uh, tap as many Merfolks as you want. Now in this deck, because of the storyline, I'm only playing with one Fuldalian Soldier. Uh, but still, it's cool. I'm really using it in my brew to kind of block and give myself time and possibly use it to feed to my spawning bat. So he's attacking with both. Not in a band because he's not paying any mana. Um, and I'm deciding to take the damage. That is really interesting. I think I should have blocked here because it's an 0-4. So maybe I'm missing something. Anyway, I'm... Oh, I am blocking one. Yeah, I am blocking one. So I'm, block I'm dropping to 12. 
For a moment there, I thought I wasn't, um, I wasn't uh, blocking. And now I have a lot of mana. Do I have something like a spawning bat? Again, a dwarven catapult would still be very powerful. I'm still on 12. It's not too bad. And I think Frank is top decking here. So things could be worse if I can cast a Dwarven Catapult. Now, he's probably thinking because I've untapped the Sand Silos. I've got two cards in hand. I've untapped the Sand Silos. So Frank knows, hey, something's going on. On the other hand, what can you do other than attack? If I've got a Dwarven Catapult, I'm going to play it anyway. And he is tapping some land. Is he going to make another play? Oh, he's actually going to attack in a band. And he's going to pump it up. So he now has a 3-2 bander. And in response, exactly. Here's the Dwarven Catapult. Now, how the Dwarven Catapult works, I'm guessing it for 6. He's got 3 creatures. That means that every creature gets 2 damage. And that means that all his creatures die. So here you can see the immense strength of a well-timed Dwarven Catapult. That's a 3 for 1. Not even a 2 for 1. It's a 3 for 1. So that's pretty insane. And now I'm going to untap. The question is, am I going to use my spawning bed? for my sand silos. And I'm gonna draw you. What I need now is a deep spawn. I just need a big creature to feed to my spawning bed. That would be ideal. And passing turn, he's playing an order of light bird. That's actually a pretty big problem because he can pump it up to a 4-1 and kill my Fuldalian war machine with this. And even if he couldn't, he could use his IO pile. So he's attacking right now. Let's see what's going to happen. I'm probably going to declare blocks. In response, he's going to he's going to pump it. And then before damage is being dealt, yeah. So he's going to pump it too, making it a four one. Yeah, he's making it a four one. In response, I'm going to sack it to my spawning bed, and that means that I don't get any damage, uh, but I also don't deal any damage because I do this before the combat damage step. And I'm showing his my, my Kamarit tokens. Uh, and I'm getting three of those because the casting cost of the Fuldalian War Machine is three. So you get Kamarit tokens equal um, equals to the casting cost. And I mean, I'm really excited about this because this is what I wanted to do with my deck. So I'm happy to see it work. Uh, at the same time, I am still in trouble. Uh, I guess I'm going to attack now. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. going to attack for three. That does mean I'm open to oh, playing another spawn. That's the downside. You saw that with Frank in game one, where he kept drawing his Goblin Kites. One Goblin Kites is enough. One Spawning Bad is enough. I'm playing, I'm not playing with four, I believe. Or am I? I need to check my own deck photo again. I forgot. Um, attacking here with the Order of Lightbur. Um, I have no blocks. He's probably going to pump it. Pumping it up to three. Or actually, he's not pumping it at all. So I'm on 10, and then he's going to play the Order of Light Burr and pass turn. So two Order of Light Burrs. What I need is another Dwarven Catapult or simply a Deep Spawn, because Deep Spawn is 6-6. Six, six. Remember, the Order of Light Burr, he can give it first strike as well. So even if I would draw a Hummered Warrior, he can simply pump it to 3-1 and give it first strike. So they're really difficult creatures to deal with. I'm actually going to block two on... Um, Tamarid token, so I'm losing two creatures here. I'm on 10. Things are not looking good for me. I need I need something powerful, but it looks like I'm just drawing into land. And that's, of course, the downside of my deck. I've decided to play with a lot of lands because it's a land-heavy heavy brew, but that means that sometimes, you know, things can go sour very quickly. I'm blocking one. How many damage am I taking? Taking four damage. Oh, and another Ecation Infantry. And this is not going good. What I need is a Dwarven Catapult. Another land. Ay, 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 ay. I guess that one card in hand is also a land. Or else I would have played it. Or maybe I want to create the threat of a Dwarven Catapult. But it doesn't really matter much. Tapping everything. Okay, I was just joking. <laughs> I remember this, actually. I was like, here it comes. And you can see my opponent's like, oh, no, are you kidding me? But no, 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 it's not that bad, Frank. And um, wow, look at that. I needed six more turns in order to get the deep spawn that I so needed. Uh, okay, well, let's go to, uh, to game number three. Game number three. And I do feel that, uh, I have to say, in the second game, I kind of had the idea that I was going to pull through after that uh, very well-timed Dwarven Catapult, but I kind of missed 
the right pulls. I didn't see any conch horns. They're pretty important in my deck, you know, just to kind of select through your cards. But okay, let's see if I can still win this match. Uh, good start here, Frank. Basic planes, starting with the sand silos. That's basically what I want to do. Just get a lot of get a lot of lands. Okay, dwarven holds. Another storage land here. Uh, let me know in the comments below what you think of storage land. I kind of like the idea of using storage lands and then just play a huge dwarven catapult, wiping the entire board. Kind of have a wrath of god effects, just a one-sided one. And a dwarven or uh, lieutenant on the board attacking here for one, and another lieutenant on the board. So there's already some pressure here by Frank, finding an IO pile that I can use to destroy one of his lieutenants, but not, not yet because I'm tapped out at the moment. He can pump them up right now, actually dealing four damage, already dropping here to 15, and that's not great. I'm probably forced, okay, finding the Fuldalian War Machine, that's four toughness, at least that saves me from one of the lieutenants. Uh, but I have to let the other go through and, and maybe he's just going to simply pump up the other one. So that still means that I'm going to take three damage. Just pumping it for one. So that means I'm dropping to 13 and playing another creature. Possibly it's an occasion infantry and an IO pile. That IO pile is interesting because it's kind of opens the door to maybe get rid of that Fodalian war machine in combat. When I block with the war machine and he gets like two damage and then you can use the IO pile to get rid of it. So, um, interesting here. I, I do think that I need to keep a mana up for the IO pile. Uh, I've untapped the sand silo, so I guess I want to do something and I'm a little bit stuck here. Just taking one counter off. Oh, this is nice playing the Fuldalian soldier. So that means that I can give uh, plus one, plus two now to my war machine and I'm playing a title flats. For the people that don't know, or uh, Tidal Influence, sorry. For the people that don't know, Tidal Influence is a hugely complicated enchantment, which is just ridiculous, uh, but it's really cool. You play it, it comes with a Tidal uh, Tide Counter into play, and if it has one Tide Counter, all your blue creatures get minus two, minus O. Oh. So right now I'm giving all my blue creatures minus two, minus O, oh. but my War Machine already is zero power, so it doesn't affect the War Machine. When it has two counters on there, nothing happens. When it has three counters on there, that's when the magic happens. All my creatures, the blue ones, get plus two, plus oh. And with four counters, you take all the counters off again. But let's take a look. Let's see what Frank's doing. Another IO pile. He has a lot of IO pile damage there. Actually taking it back. I think probably the best thing to do in his shoes right now is first to attack and kind of see how damage is being divided. And then he can always choose to play out his IO pile. But of course, I don't know what else is in his hand. Usually attacking first is the best thing to do. Playing a storage land. Coming into play tapped, of course. What is he going to do? Tapping red. I mean, he wants to use his IO pile on my Fuldalian soldier. In response, I'm tapping it to give my war machine uh, plus one, plus two, I believe. And he's playing another IO pile. So that means that it's really difficult, at least for one turn, to get rid of the War Machine. And he just passes turn. I need to change my title influence count to two, by the way. I hope that I'm still going to do that. Yes, thank you. Uh, playing a Goblin War Drums. Yeah. And here you can see the downside of playing these complicated combos. When you have just a few parts of the combo puzzle, they're pretty useless by you know on itself like a tidal influence is great when you've got a lot of creatures blue creatures but right now it's worthless same thing can be said for the war drums i mean i've got a wall a wall with menace i mean that's that's not useful attacking here probably going to choose to well either way i think my wall is going to die here because of that io pile at least if frank wants to kill it because maybe he doesn't see it really as a threat since it doesn't kill anything I'm declaring blockers, it's kind of hard to tell. I guess I'm, I'm, I'm blocking one of the lieutenants and then using an IO pile before damage is dealt because I just want to save my wall here. That does mean I'm dropping to 11 and ah, there's another creature, a Z-Lot this time. And the Tidal Influence is ticking up to three. So that means my wall gets plus two plus O. Oh, so now it's a two four wall. Again, it's not really gonna help me here. 
Um, the reason I'm untapping my um, my storage lands here is that just in case I'm going to draw into a Dwarven Catapult, I want to be able to use it straight away and have enough mana available. So that's why I'm untapping the storage lands kind of one, one every time. So one remains tapped and the other one gets untapped. Hand of Justice. Oh, and in response, I am casting a Dwarven Catapult. Oh, this is pretty good actually. Destroying all his creatures. So in response on the cast, I'm casting Dwarven Catapult. Remember, it's an instant. But there is a Hand of Justice on the side of Frank. Hand of Justice, extremely powerful creature. And it is a 2-6. Remember, he needs three white creatures and tap to destroy a creature on my side. But besides that, besides the ability itself, it is also a huge, powerful creature. It is 2 six, six toughness it is so difficult to kill this creature i need a deep spawn and i need it right now i've got three deep spawn in my deck i need a deep spawn i need a spawning bed and i need to get into some action he's actually attacking now i think i'm going to take the two the reason is if i decide to block he can use his io pile to kill my wall finding his first white creature finding his second white creature so that means um he only needs one more white let's see tapping 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 are we going to see a deep spawn? Yes, a deep spawn. Ha <laughs> ha, yes. This is what I want to do. Of course, the problem is if Frank can find one more white creature, don't do it, don't do it. He can kill my deep spawn with his hand and another hand of justice. And look at that. This is what Frank wants to do. And I have to say, he's not lucky. It's not a coincidence because he plays with a full play set of hand of justices. So, um, this is part of his tactic and you know i think it's a good tactic frank because hand of justice in this format is just crazy strong and right now playing a homerid warrior now remember for one blue i can give homerid warrior uh, hex proof but it taps itself and it doesn't untap the next turn so it's not an ideal situation let's first see what's going to happen here i just want to make it as complicated as possible for frank and hopefully he's going to start making some mistakes and i can get kind of back in this game although i have no idea how um, he's actually tapping three here, probably going to try and kill my Hummered Warrior. So I'm going to use the Hexproof effect. And I'm using my Timmy Talks button to indicate that it doesn't untap next turn. Now remember, the Hexproof only lasts until end of turn. So at the end of Frank's turn, uh, or I should say at the start of my turn, it doesn't have Hexproof anymore. And uh, I'm reading it again just to make sure. And also, you know, we're playing very relaxed because, you know, we're playing with these crazy, crazy Fallen Empire cards that you don't play with all the time. So we are, you know, discussing it. And at the same time, we're very competitive because, you know, if you make a little mistake in this, in this, uh, in these matches, uh, that can really make a big difference. And there we see the shield. So the shield, uh, if you tap, can give plus O plus two. And let's see. I don't really see a way out of here for me, if I'm honest. Like, I don't want to want to ruin anything. But I don't really see how I can get back from this. It looks like I'm really struggling playing an IO pile. Problem is with the IO pile, he has that shield. And the shield is just fantastic. It gives plus O plus two. So if I use my IO pile in response, he can pump his creature let's first see what frank's gonna do here um it's all looking pretty stuck here at the moment at least for me it is he's attacking with his order of light burr and oh yeah i want to use my io pile because i thought he actually had a sword instead of a shield i remember this and then he allowed me to take it back and in pure desperation i did <laughs> <laughs> so thank you frank for allowing that i thought he had the it's called the zealon sword where you give extra power i really like that to include the shield in these builds by the way because everybody's playing with io piles anyway i was kind of forced to to block on the ebon hand i think this this whole play it, it doesn't matter anymore i mean i, I want to finish it because hey maybe there's a little opening and but you know at the same time I realize it's it's almost impossible. And this is cool. I'm actually, I'm playing another deep spawn. That's cool. 
Uh, remember, Deep Spawn, you can also give it hexproof, but it does the same thing as the Hamrit Warrior. It gives itself hexproof, but it taps itself and it doesn't untap until the next turn. So, and he's trying to remove it, and you can actually see that happening now. I'm playing a blue, it becomes tapped. So the, but the button is there to indicate that it doesn't untap next turn. Just as a little reminder, um, he can now, if he wants to kill the Hamrit Warrior, or he can just attack with the Ebon Hand. I mean, he's got a lot of options here, and it's never good when your opponent has too many options. And he is now, yeah, the Deep Spawn no longer has Hexproof because it's only until end of turn, and now both of the creatures are tapped, and they won't untap next turn. And I'm actually showing him. I thought I thought I was already dead. That's why I showed in my hand. I've, I've got two Darylors, and the Darylors did a fantastic job for me in game one. But here, you, of course, you can see the downside of playing with so many colors is I couldn't find a second, or I couldn't find a swamp, just a swamp in general. And uh, I think that's it. Taking the buttons off because now they're gonna untap next turn. But I don't think there's gonna be a next turn. I'm on five right now. Everything is tapped. I only have the IO pile. And I think I'm going to use it on Frank. So at least I've dealt some damage to him. I'm going to drop to 18, but I'm going to die. Showing him my hand. I've had two Darylors in there for a long time. Unfortunate, unfortunate. Playing against these Hand of Justices. They're, they're just so strong. Frank, congratulations. You've won your first game in the Fallen Empires tournament. Let me know if you like these Fallen Empire uh games by the way and then I'll, I'll i'll upload some more and talking about fallen empire games uh keep an eye on the channel because we will be um live streaming the fallen empires tournament at a certain point as well so we will be live streaming some games we'll be live streaming the top eight the semi-finals hopefully uh, and also the final of the tournament itself. So if you enjoy Fallen Empires, keep an eye on the channel for sure. Uh, if you want to support the channel, as always, you can help us by subscribing, by leaving a like, watching the video like you just did. So thank you very much for that. Also, leave a comment. Let me know what you think and share it on your socials. All that helps. You can also become a Patreon and then you can actually join crazy tournaments like this um, and you can also join our Discord and you can find out, you know, you can share some deck tech, whatever. Uh, there's a link popping up right now. You can click and just have a look at the Teaming Talks Patreon page. I would really appreciate it. Talking about Patreon, let's take a look at our patrons. Let's go to the end scroll. What shall we do with the Just think it's a Sumba Kazik!